crop is a crop that you plant that it's just there to keep the soil nice and blanketed so that everything stays healthy and fresh throughout the whole winter. Sometimes these crops also serve the purpose of reinvigorating the soil. So there's like winter wheat, and some people will sow out things like red clover. These take and improve the soil through the course of the winter by adding some nitrogen to it. But you can also take and do things like snow peas. You can take and sow out forage if you want something that's flowering. You can sow out turnips to take and till the ground. If you really want to till the soil deep, you can throw out tillage radish, also known as daikon. And if you have a flair for Japanese or other Asian cooking, daikon pops up in those dishes a lot and it can be harvested throughout the whole winter. And we're talking a plant, by the way, that has a root on it that's about that big around once it gets going and can easily take and start turning into the soil that deep. So you can get a plant that will till the ground deeper than most of our tillers can sink into it at home. Not to mention, it's in the mustard family because it's a radish and that tends to take its fresh full of growth. And who doesn't like suppressing wheat growth? So the problems with the fall garden, because all good things have issues. The best spring, summer varieties are always the best fall varieties. In spring and summer, we want things that mature at a more steady pace, possibly have better drought resistance, probably more resistance to disease. And one thing I have definitively learned in my decade now of professional horticultural work is that whenever you improve something in a plant, there's almost always a trade-off of something else becoming weaker. In the fall, you want stuff that can withstand more frost, which means usually they can't take more heat. You want stuff that can mature quicker, which usually means that as you plant it in the summer, it bolts faster, and it winds up, in the case of lettuces, tasting off, because they get that bitter taste to them if they start going to seed. You do have to pay more attention. It is definitely something that requires a significant amount of planning and just watching them. And that's a significant amount compared to gardening. And I like to tell people, your garden should be somewhere where you are. You never want it to be like, here is my house in my front door and the garden is 400 feet back that direction. If my front door is right here, and it's 90 degrees outside, I don't want to go 400 foot that direction. Especially if I have to drag the hose 400 foot that direction. That's why my house, my tomato plants, my other vegetables, when I can get them in the ground, sits literally between my driveway, the front of my house, and my front door. There's literally a square right there, and that's where I put my garden beds. I'll wind up having somewhere in the neighborhood of about 32, 45 square foot of garden space right there that I can take advantage of. And that's before I start stacking stuff in there because you can grow some things under stuff, like I did last year with my sweet potatoes that we used to make sweet potato grass roll for Thanksgiving. That was really cool, by the way. If you've never grown your own sweet potatoes and then used it to make your own sweet potato casserole, it is awesome. <laughs> Trying to find the ratios for how many sweet potatoes equals a can of sweet potatoes, though, that is a problem. <laughs> By the way, it varies a lot between the recipe and the sweet potato size. Unexpected heat or drought. Who remembers a couple of years ago where we went 70 days without any rain between September and October? That doesn't normally happen in Tennessee in the fall. We get at least a little rain in that period of time. Sometimes it gets hot. Sometimes it gets colder. Um, Fall planting limits the work you can do with the soil when it's easiest to dig and till. So, I said earlier, fall, lower moisture, the soil is easier to work with. If you have plants in the soil, you can't take and work on the soil unless you have your plants working for you, which brings us back to the daikon radish. There are still some pests and disease active in the fall. You can always take and get like a little late run of squash bug. You can always take and get a few more aphids popping through. There are a lot more uh, like cabbage caterpillars coming in. You'll have a lot of them attacking all of your brassicas. So not just your cabbage, but they'll also get on your Brussels sprouts. They'll get on your broccoli. They'll get on your kale. 
good news is they're small. They're easy to see on the underside of the leaves. If you have chickens, they love to eat them. So who can grow a fall garden? Literally anybody. Because you can grow it in all sorts of conditions. You can grow it in your current garden plot. You can underplant the plants. You can take put them in pots on the porch. You take put them on pots on other people's porches. Anywhere that you grew stuff this summer, that you tried growing stuff this spring, you can take and try planting out and grow them again. You can even grow stuff in and amongst each other. That hinder problem. So where do you, you plant? Like I said, anywhere. You can take them as you pull plants out because stuff definitely always becomes disease or it takes the peters out and starts producing less. You just swap out plants. So say you have your run of tomatoes and you have to pull one out because it's got way too much early or late blight on it. You've just been fighting it all year. In that spot, you can take and swap out for okra. You can take and swap out to start throwing in some more beans. That way you can do a late season crop of uh, lettuces. You just take and keep rotating stuff. And unexplored microclimates. I have this cool little spot in the back of my house. It gets really good sun first thing in the morning. And kind of decently on up through noon, one o'clock. So, and it's the largest brick face on my entire house. So it soaks a lot of heat. It's also where my fire, my dryer vent takes and flushes out. So there's a lot of excess heat from there. And I keep the door to the washing room closed all the time. So that's always warmer than the rest of the house. There's always this airflow. I had a goji berry in a pot I had sitting right there. That that goji berry, it stayed green until the big, heavy frosts and freezes we got in January last year. So always be looking for spots around the house and in your yard and in your garden where the confluxes of nature and construction and plants just take and give you little spots where you can do different things. Somewhere that's close to the kitchen, again, not 400 yards back, you want it nearby, especially in the winter, because as much as we hate going outside whenever it's hot, we really don't like going outside whenever it's cold. Especially if you have to worry about tripping, slipping, sliding. None of that stuff makes it fun. What makes it fun is being able to go like, I want a fresh salad and not having to run to the store. You just walk out your door. When do you plant a fall garden? Right now. You can start your plantings for fall right this instance. And you can keep them going right through to like mid-September and some stuff you can get away with going through to the end of September. The cool thing about most of our root crops that we like think of like those little root crops that aren't like uh, potatoes, because sometimes I have issues with language, is carrots, radishes, beets, all of those come up really, really fast. So I've seen them sprout in three days. And as soon as they have their second or third set of true leaves on them, they're pretty much cold resistant. They're not going to mine anything except for like a really hard detrimental frost. If you can get a blanket out over top of them, they'll be fine for that. You can even sprinkle a little straw. Planting is dependent on a variety of time to maturity. So how fast the plant grows, how fast it gets to that mature size where it can tolerate cold, or that you can harvest it before we get that last frost through, that affects when you can take put things out. So then what is this cutoff number with the frost? So average first frost is defined as the first time the air temp is at or below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, thus providing a chance of frost because the water vapor can actually freeze in the plants. Our average first frost date, depending on who you talk to and what you're reading, is either October 15th, or the one I prefer, October 14th, because this also helps me remember my anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> so how then do you plan your planting dates? That way you can have all your stuff organized and in order. 
So for all fall vegetables, you use this following formula. You begin with the average date of frost, which was? You determine if the plant you're growing can take a light freeze before harvest. This will adjust the starting date by one to two weeks. So if it's beans, we have to take and pull it back two weeks. If it's a radish or snow peas, we can actually take and push it forward two weeks. Most seed packets estimate the days to maturity from planting. So there's your necessary information. And then you're going to add about 10 days because as we're going into fall, the sun's getting lower in the sky. It's taking and getting weaker. The rays are getting the earth less. Shadows are getting longer. And then once we have all this information, you're going to subtract the total number of days required from the growing date. You want it to be in maturing to find the latest planting date. So that's a whole bunch of word problems there on that one page. Does anyone here like word problems? No, you do. That is awesome. You're doing much better than I am. Keep that up. So here's the guy. Here's an example. So October fifteenth, because that's what's in the literature. Days to mature after planting, fifty. So in this instance, we're actually talking about some uh, um, green beans, some snap beans. So add 10 days, so that's 60 days for maturity. So October 15th minus 60 days gives us August 15th. So for a set of snap beans that matures out in 50 days, we would be planting them by mid-August. Did everybody get that? Uh, no worries. Sometimes I click too fast. So, how do you plant the fall garden? I keep talking about all these things, and I'm not telling you how to do anything yet. Pretty much the same as you do a spring or summer garden. It's not really going to be a lot different besides the planting and the time you put it out. Because we have it ingrained in our head that spring is the time to plant. Thanks to culture, thanks to marketing, thanks to whenever things become available. It's just literally just ground into us. I have been for a decade now trying to get people to understand that you don't want to put three inch caliber trees in the end of May in Tennessee. That's a good way to kill a tree. Don't put trees in that big at the end of May. You need to do a soil test if you haven't done it in one in a while. So I'm going to give you the quick and dirty rundown on doing a soil test. Step one, get a shovel. Step two, get a bucket. Anywhere between two to five gallons is fine. Step three, you're gonna start in one corner of the space you wish to do your soil test in. No matter how big it is or how small, if you're gonna start in that corner, you're gonna take that shovel and you're gonna get the whole of the spade down in there. You're gonna lift it straight back up. You're gonna come down the other side. This is gonna pull you a wedge. It looks about like this. And the bottom of that wedge, you're gonna take out about this much soil from the bottom of that wedge. You're going to throw that into your bucket. You're going to drop your wedge back in the spot that you pulled it up from. So this way we're not overly disturbing the soil. And then you're going to take, you're going to walk in a direction that's about halfway to the other side of your garden space. And you're going to repeat this process. And then you're going to go out to the edge of the garden space on that angle. And then you're just going to play palm for a little bit. Walk a little bit, dig, walk out to the edge, dig. Just repeat until you get to the end. You're going to mix all that soil up that you've been throwing the plugs in to the bucket. You're going to make sure that it is dry because your extension agents do not want to have to handle wet soil. They can't test it. It has to be dried first. So this will delay your results if you bring in wet soil to the extension agents. They have to set up on the window sills, let it dry out, all sorts of stuff so they can set it off. So bring in the soil dry. And the amount of soil you need to bring in is about a hand, is about a sandwich bag full. Because that's what fits inside the little box they send off. They'll have a form for you to take and fill out with all your contact information and what you're wanting to grow in the area that you pulled the soil test. You can test one sample, at least as of the last time I checked, three different ways. 
So if you want to take and figure out what would be the best thing to put in here with the least amount of work, you can just go like, I want to do a vegetable garden, I want to do a perennial cutting garden, and I want to grow fruit trees. And you can see, and they'll send you back a test result. I have seen it take anywhere between one to three weeks. Usually it should be closer to that hour on two weeks. And if you don't understand the sheet of paper that they send you, they'll be all over it with you. Or you can find a friendly master gardener that hopefully understands it and can make sense of it. Because sometimes even I can't make sense of those sheets. Because I don't get to see them as often as I would like. And that'll tell you what you have to do to improve your soil. And then it's the fall, best time to improve your soil because you have the entire winter to let Mother Nature work everything in the ground. Because there's nothing like the freezing and thawing of the soil to take and work everything in nice and deep and improve the ground. Again, we're letting nature do work for us. I'm a really big fan of that, if you haven't told yet. Because the less work I have to do, the better. Fulci. Mulch. Always mulch. Mulching is never a bad idea. Except whenever you pile the mulch up the sides of your plant. Don't pile mulch up the sides of your plant. This is within your friendly landscaping PSA. Seed depth needs to be twice as deep as recommended. So what's normal recommended depth? So if that is your seed depth, so I want everyone to squint your eyes and imagine a sunflower seed. Most sunflower seed is about this big. So normally, we want to take and plant sunflower seed about that far under the soil, and it will do okay. It will come up in a timely manner. We don't have to worry about it rotting on us or anything. Now, I then need you to stretch your imagination and imagine that sunflower is a plant that will actually grow through the winter. So if this is our sunflower seed for the winter, we'd have to double that depth. We are going to plant it out in the late summer because we have to get it down into cooler soil so that it actually takes and has the temperatures it needs to germinate. Because a lot of people never think about this. Seed can take and germinate in the dark. Seed can take and germinate with a modicum amount of moisture. Seed will not germinate if it's in the wrong temperatures. So fescue, because everyone likes grass around here for some reason, it wants to take and be seeded out so it can grow in temperatures that are around like 45 to 65 degrees. It wants a cooler soil temperature. Whereas a big mistake a lot of people make with their pepper plants, whenever they try to grow them from seed at the house, is they just let the seed sit in the containers at the temperature of the house, which is maybe like ambiently about 70 degrees once it all averages out. Those seeds want to be like in the 80s and their soil temperature. So if you've ever had issues taking and getting pepper seeds to grow, check the temperature. So yeah, there we go. So a half inch tall seed would need to be at one inch planting depth. This also then means that if you have a seed that's like this big, don't put it down two inches in the soil. <laughs> it doesn't need that. There's also a way to cheat all of this that is really easy. It is called cardboard. And you take and you want miss the soil where you just sowed your seeds. And you lay the cardboard down on top of it. And then you tack the cardboard down with like any root loose limbs or a couple of stones or something. And every two or three days, as you would expect the plant to be starting to mature out, you go out there and you gently lift the cardboard up and you see the seed sprouts. Because remember, seed can germinate in the dark. So what you would do then is whenever you actually see all the little guys starting to pop up, you would go through and late in the evening pull the cardboard off so the plants can harden off overnight and you're not in the middle of the day exposed to the burning sun. At that point, they all turn into vampires. And you might go through and sprinkle just a little bit of straw or something around them that they can still grow up through real easy. That way you give them a little bit of more protection until they come on up. But that's how you can trick stuff to get more moisture on them. Because you never want your seeds to dry out while they're trying to germinate. It's like trying to talk and suddenly your mouth just goes dry. Nothing works right. 
So preparing your ground or the pot, pull up all the dead and unproductive stuff. Anything of that that's on top of the ground you want to get rid of. Um, if it is diseased, you don't want to till it in the soil, other stuff you can. You can also take put some stuff in the composting. If it's really badly infested or infected, and you want to try to keep some nutrients on the ground on, on your property, you can burn it to ash. Just don't use any accelerants other than maybe dryer lens to take get the fire started. This is an excellent opportunity if you've never practiced making your own fires to learn how to start a fire. Because if you can get plant material to burn that doesn't actually want to burn, you have accomplished your goals. Remove all insect and disease infested material. This is very important. That's why it's in your place. See, burn. Fire could be good. Add compost after cleanup to revitalize the soil. People are catching on to this really well now, but whenever we're talking about feeding plants, we're really talking about feeding the soil. Because the soil is where the plants live. So where we live is somewhere around Rutherford County, most of us. So it does us no good to take and have to be fed elsewhere. We eat here. So we eat where we live. So we have to have food where we live at. Otherwise, we have to do really long, complicated trips to go get things. We don't want to make plants do long, complicated trips to go get things because they don't actually live around. They can get really good, massive root systems to them, and they can make, like, effectively little super highways. But you feed plants where they're at, and that's in the soil. You feed the soil, you feed your plants. And feeding the soil also increases your microbial life, which further feeds and enriches your soil. You may want to replace the soil in containers if they are used in the summer. This is usually most important if you use, um, let me make sure I get my terminology right so everyone's on the same page. If you use overly processed fertilizers, so usually these are going to be things that have a lot of salts in them, or heavy metals, or metals as their method of conveyance. Uh, my go-to to take and just beat like a dead horse with a stick is Miracle Grow. Miracle Grow is a water soluble fertilizer for what its original purpose was, which is to take and make annual plants become nice, big, bushy plants that look really healthy and have a decent number of flowers on them. It does a really good job because we're constantly watering our annuals and we're generally putting them in places where they're not around for long enough for us to really care about after effects. It causes problems though when you start using Miracle Grow on like your tomato plants or your blueberry bushes. Because if you ever look at the fertilizer line for Miracle Grow, you'll see something that resembles like 36, 9, 10, something like that. So that first number is nitrogen. Nitrogen is what makes plants grow nice and big and put on all sorts of green growth. Over Three quarters of the nitrogen in Miracle Grow is water soluble. That means the plants, as long as soon as water hits it, it can take and pull it in. It doesn't have to do any sort of breaking down. The other two numbers are phosphorus and potassium. So here's a fun thing about nitrogen. If you get too much nitrogen down on a plant and you don't have enough water available to it, it will burn it like you just put a blowtorch to it. That's why if you've ever had a shrub and grandma put Miracle Grow onto it and then didn't bother to water it for another two weeks afterwards, or you've heard old farmers talking about not putting fresh chicken manure down on things, that's why that nitrogen is burning the plants. And it takes it, it'll kill them off. So you over fertilize, and then it's conveyed by salts. So the salt starts locking up all of your other nutrients in the soil. So you have to use this stuff judiciously if you're going to use it. If you're doing it in containers, you're leaving all of this stuff behind in the soil because the water will just take and run through over time. But all the salts will stay there. If you want to see an excellent example of this, stop by the nursery in about two weeks and look at all the plants we have out on our hill. We run two wells. Both wells have a heavy amount of lime in 
So you'll go out usually about midday after the irrigation system is run and to any given plant on that hill where we have this nice big black landscape fabric pulled out. And you take a plant and you lift it up and set it inside, you will notice that besides the fact that the spot underneath the pot is glistening from moisture, it's also much darker. Meanwhile, the stuff around where that pot is sitting is much grayer. And that's because all that lime is being left behind whenever all the water dries. And the lime that would have been sitting in the spot where that pot is, is actually sitting in the soil. And the salts from those liquid fertilizers and other sorts of manufactured, heavily processed fertilizers are the same way. That's why a lot of organic gardeners and green gardeners and just people who want to be more friendly on the environment really hard on using compost, especially compost to make it home, because it's a lot better for everything. So all that being said, probably a good idea to swap out the soil in your containers at least every year or two, depending on what you're using. If you're not having a fall garden now, is the time to have a soil test run and amendments made. Thank you, man. It's also a good time to do some of this stuff. So on these pages, you take and you have an example of lasagna gardening, what's known as sheet mulching, and a Google culture bed, which means hill or high culture. It's a really great way to put in a whole bunch of absorbing material into your soil. So in all these three sets, the process that we're trying to hone in on is Mother Nature's ability over time to turn compostable material into good soil. So you can set this stuff up in the fall, and then by spring, it's good to plant in. And both of these cases, everything will take them broke down and turned into a very rich, humid layer. That nice black compost we like to try and get out of our compost bins. In the case of the hoople mounds, the wood starts getting to soak up all sorts of water through the course of the winter, and then it can, over the course of the spring and the summer, whenever it's not being able to recharge from the rain, it can very slowly leach out moisture into the surrounding soil. It almost acts as a wick. It also acts as a reservoir and a home for soil microbiology. The chief among these being the mycorrhizal fungi. Now these funguses, there are a whole range of different fungus that takes and attaches to plant roots, and they have two purposes in life. Purpose one is to find water and nutrients for the plants they're attached to. Purpose two is to get a little sugar back for this work. And then of course they have the de facto purpose of reproducing, which everything on this planet has the goal of. So they go out and they like can upwards of a hundred times increase the root mass of plants. They also take and they store water in their hyphae. So along their bodies, they're storing water. So not only are you getting a water reservoir in the wood, you're getting a water reservoir in the fungus. And all this can take and then be fed over to the plants. And they don't stress as much whenever we have dry or hot spells because they have constant access to moisture. It makes everything a lot more resilient. And eventually, once you have good enough soil built up, it makes your garden more resilient because it holds on to moisture and nutrients better. Thank you very much. Any questions about that full sheet? And I do try to stick around for a while afterwards if I have any questions. Um, oh, one little quick fact about organic material in your soil. A 1% increase in the organic content of your soil can double the amount of moisture and air that it can hold. So getting organic material into, feeding your soil, really, really, really improves things. And then the fall, of course, like I said, that frost thaw cycle takes works everything deeply into the ground. There we go. Dealing with frost. Because, you know, it's going to happen, unless it's last year where it didn't really happen until like nearly Thanksgiving when you get a really hard one until Christmas. But it's Tennessee. Weather's well, weird here. So if the frost warning is mild, so predicting no lower than 30 degrees, you can try covering up tender plants. You can use burlap, you can use sheets, you can use 
used pots, floating row cover. Um, carrots, radishes, they're usually pretty sturdy to cold, but you can take and make them even tough by just sprinkling some straw over top of them. You can do this also with your straw berries. Kind of hence the name. Whenever we do an animal, we get that frost spell. Do not panic. We live in Tennessee. We live in North America. We have this wonderful little period that inevitably occurs after that first frost where it warms back up. This is colloquially known as Indian summer. And it's like, this is the time that we haven't gotten our acts together, because whoever does, to go outside and harvest everything that we still need to harvest. It's a little bit more comfortable outside still. We can do a lot of work. We can get stuff settled in that we haven't gotten settled in yet. We can pull in that last little bit. Maybe things needed some time to finish. Maybe things needed to take and grow on up a little bit. And that period can last between a week and almost a month. This last year has lasted almost three. So just get all that stuff pulled in as you can. Freeze it, can it, eat it, give it away to people, store it for next year to take it so out again. I share it with all of y'all a trick. Whoever here has had tomatoes, that it's like I still have a ton of tomatoes on these plants. It's about to freeze. I can tell you how to fix this problem. So our average first frost is October 14th, 15th, right? So if you'll way back over in mid-September, Go through and all your tomato plants, cut the tops out of them. Just go through a pair of pruners or scissors or something and just cut all the tops out of them. The tomato plants are going to read it as something is eating me. I need to reproduce so I can continue on. It's going to then take, instead of throwing sugars into those growing tips to keep growing, it's going to throw all that sugar into the fruit. It's going to force them to wipe ripen off. So if you'll go through and you'll top your tomato plants out in mid-September, the beginning of September, you'll take and have everything kind of start ripening up and get harvested before we get that frost in. Pepper plants make this process even easier. Because, strange thing a lot of people don't know, in their native climate, peppers are multi-year perennial shrubs. So we can do two things with peppers. When we're feeling really industrious, we can just dig the little guys up put them into a pot and bring them to the house. And then we can plant them out again next year. Next year they're going to give us even more peppers because they don't have to worry about growing in. If you don't want to fool with that, you can take them go out there with a spading fork or a digging fork. It's those heavy, usually three to four tined, short, and I mean they're usually not any bigger than this right here, forks. You just go in down next to the plant, and you go in around, and you just slowly lift that plant up out of the soil. Take some newspaper, you spritz it down with water, you wrap that around the root ball, and you go hang the whole plant in the garage. So all the sugar is going to flush out of the roots down into the per the plant, the plant, uh, the fruit, and it's going to ripen on out. And then as peppers, we pick those at all stages of being ready to pick anyway. So you can then go through and just pick them off as you need them to. It's an awesome trick for dealing with late season pepper plants. So, floating row cover, that's this right here. Traditionally, it was used a lot in tobacco farming. They still use it for whoever does still farm tobacco because that stuff, it'll take and keep the soil, the timbers underneath it, usually warm by a degree or three, which is generally enough to keep the plants from dying frost. And it's light enough, it'll actually grow with, it'll lift up as the plants grow. So it's not going to depress the plants in. So you can even use it as a shade cover on stuff that is exceptional. Heat sensitive to keep the temperature underneath it one to three degrees cooler because it's providing that shade. So this is a really cool thing called a cloche. Uh, you can get really fancy glass ones like this that usually have like some sort of like cork stopper in the top so you can take and lift that off to let it vent during the day when all the sun's hitting it or you can drop it on at night to take and trap all the heat and humidity in there 
or you could just take a gallon milk jug, cut the bottom off of it, poke a hole in the lid, not a string on one side of it, pull the string through, tie that off to the handle of the gallon milk jug, and you just go set it down on top of the plant. And you have a little cheap plug jig to take it and cover up your sensitive plants for frost. This works just as good in the spring as it does in the fall. Um, cold frames, now this is where you can get some real season extension. These guys right here, what you do is you have yourself a bedding area. You have yourself in a box built around it. The box is a very loose turf, just something that surrounds it and kind of can form sides that retain, helps retain heat, insulates a little bit. And then the whole thing is tilted towards the south. That way you get all that good sun in there. And then the top can either be really nice little flip-up glass panes like this. It can be plexiglass. It can be recycled old windows. It can be greenhouse plastic. Anything that's clear will let sunlight through while it keep heat from bending out. Uh, uh, you just put your plants down in there, and they take it. They've got all the warmth they need usually. And if you need to take it and put some more warmth in there, you can make deep sand beds underneath those. You can take and put uh, gallon milk jugs that you have full of water and are painted black. Set them in there. They'll absorb heat and they'll filter it out throughout the night. And it really, really lets you extend the season because not only can you with those grow later into the fall and winter on certain things, you can also start stuff earlier in the year. You can even take one of these and actually just dig a pit in the ground put some good compost in there in the fall. Something maybe still needs to cook down a little bit because that's going to generate some heat. And then in the spring, you could start like your broccoli in there early. You could start some pepper plants in there and some tomatoes. There are lots of old guys, some of whom are no longer around up in the Northeast, that they used to do this every single year. And that's how they got the early starts on the transplants. So, Whenever I said that box is a very loose term, that's hay bales just wrapped around it. They got really fancy with this one though. They stair stepped them. They have just a little frame in there to take and let the plastic roll up and down. You can even buy these little actuators that you can hook to a thermostat. And then as the temperature in there rises, if you have a range set, It'll actually lift and lower the edge for venting throughout the day. So you don't have to worry about manually getting out there and doing it. You just let it go and do its thing. All you have to do is make sure that nothing's dead once, you're, once every day or two. And make sure everything stays moist enough. And whoever here has done that trick where you start seeds and like the little salad tray that you got from Wendy's, how often do you have to water those once you get them wet originally? Not very often, usually. Oh, poop house. This one's actually built right onto their garden beds. And then old-fashioned, simple little wood frame one. That one's got where it's the whole thing is plastic. So you just set that down over top of your plants. And you can make a lot of this with just recycled and reclaimed materials that people are normally going to throw out. Sometimes nowadays that stuff actually does get reused, fortunately. But you can even take and go out to the restore place that Habitat Command has, and you can get cheap windows. And you can use those windows for the tops of your cold frames. Some other best practices. Remember that containers can be moved. You can shift them around as case needs be. So it's going to be a freeze that night. Just pull the plants up on the porch in the pots. And you can set them back out again in the morning as you go to leave for work. You can take a move them around where you get more sun. You can actually follow the sun throughout the day if you want to be that diligent. Plan the fall garden at the same time you're planting your spring gardens because seed varieties run out fast sometimes. So you want to make sure that you have everything you need before you have to have it. This is one of those few instances where it's better to not need it and have it 
than to need it and not have it. Include Joe's seed needs in your spring and summer orders. Again, to make sure you get that stuff in at all time. Direct seeding is the best way to plant the fall garden, but be sure to protect the young sprouts. You can start stuff in the house too, just like what you're doing with the rear spring plants. Uh, thin layers of organic mulch work great at retaining soil moisture, which is really important for your seeds to get started. By thin, I mean like that thick to this thick, so one to two inches. Because normally when we're talking about mulching, we're talking about four inches or deeper mulch. So if you're going thin, you're going thin. It also takes and makes things warmer because that's what mulch does. Mulch stabilizes soil temperature, stabilizes soil moisture. Uh, best vegetables for fall gardening? Pretty much everything you would think. So kale, collards, cool season vegetables of all sorts and types, carrots, arugula, a lot of things that you normally think of as leaf greens. Uh, to keep it simple, your leaf greens, your brassicas, so broccoli, Brussels sprouts, root crops, radishes, turnips, carrots. For those of you who didn't get all that page. Selecting plant varieties, we're looking for fast germination, we're looking for rapid times of maturity, we're looking for cold tolerance or cold preference, we're looking for pest and disease resistance. So, early grown tomatoes, you wouldn't think of this as a variety for fall planting, but early grown tomatoes mature out in like 65 days. So that means you can take and put them out right now and you would definitively have more tomatoes by the time we got to fall. So while your other tomato plants that you planted back in April or May are finishing up and that might be at the end of their runs, these late season early girls that you planted out, they're just now starting to come in. You can do the same thing with cherry tomatoes and with Roma tomatoes. And then of course there are other varieties that are long keepers that, and there's actually one called long keeper that if you put them away correctly, they can last for two to three months just as the tomato. But they don't come in until nearly the very end of the year. Um, winter squash is an excellent example of this. It takes it over a hundred days to mature out. But it takes and it grows fine through a frost or two. It's actually preferable for them to get a little cold chill on them before you harvest. It hardens everything off on them. And then the squash themselves can last for up to six months at store properly, sometimes longer. I've heard one anecdote where a guy had one sitting in a cool, dry spot for nearly a year before his wife might have looked at him and went like, dude, seriously, this thing needs to go somewhere. <laughs> uh, radishes, sweet peas. Uh, so butterhead lettuce, collard greens. I really have to get this picture in here, but at one point I took a photo of the display beds out here of some spinach. And it was in that 2012-2013 winter where it was like bone chillingly cold for like a month. There was spinach out there in those beds just going about its merry business. Just growing and growing and growing. Just sitting there, it's like, yep, yeah, it'll be warm again soon. I can take grow some more. It had enough fresh green leaves on there that if you really wanted to get some, you'd go out there and pick a small salad's worth. Uh, mustard is great. Um, mustard is also great for early season planting because it works as what's known as a trap plant. The pests, if they're going to hit anything, they'll usually go after the mustard first. And it's mustard. It grows fast. You don't have to have a lot of it to have good effect. So you just take it, if it comes really infested, you pull the whole plant up, take it, you go compost or burn it to ash, and then, hey, you got rid of that first run of pests. Uh, leaf salad mixes, these are often called musculine mixes. Uh, little gem head lettuce. 
really like where uh, Jack Smith went through and put in some good work because I have Sean in a little bit of his presentation. That's why his name's the beginning of the slide. Um, a lot of information for it. Uh, of course, beets. Now, there are several different types of beets that aren't only good for their root. They also make good greens. So you can take and pick one or two runs of greens off those beets and eat that as part of your salad mixes and then eat the fruit, the root later. Different types of spinach. Now, as much as spinach is a cold season crop, there are also spinaches that work really well even for heat. These are usually things like strawberry, New Zealand, or uh, it's like, a, it starts with an M, I can't remember the name of it right now, and I believe one of my books again. But if you ever see it, it'll usually have on there heat tolerance, and that it's not an actual spinach, but it just looks and cooks like spinach, and tastes like spinach. Uh, winter squashes, cool benefit of winter squash besides you know that long keeping effect. Vine board does not like winter squash. The vine on it is so stout, the borers rarely ever give them any trouble. So if you're just being constantly beat to death by vine by squash vine board, just take and give up on yellow crookneck and zucchini for a year and plant this out. Swiss chard, once you get it established, it also makes for great summer picking. It is a really nice, tough plant once it gets going. And it'll take low shade conditions, which is, well, low sun conditions, so in the shade, like a lot of other leaf greens will. So if you have a shadier spot, you want something colorful in there, and things like that rainbow Swiss chard, beautiful in those areas. Which brings us to another topic that at some point I'll get more into which is landscaping with your vegetable plants, because a lot of them are really pretty. Cabbages, carrots, and then carrots, once they get to where they're good size and ripe enough for you to take and pull up, they're easy enough to store by just lightly brushing all the loose soil debris off of them. And you can just store them really easily by taking and putting a little layer of sand into the bottom of the tote and then taking and stacking a single row of carrots down through there and just quick misting them a little bit and then cover them up with sand. You just repeat this process until you get to the top. This keeps enough moisture on them to keep them healthy from drying out, but not so much that they rot. And we went through and we cut like just, not like at the top of the carrot, but like a quarter inch away from it. So we still got those little spurts of green on there Get that off. We just have all this carrots just sitting in their store for the winter. You can go in there as you need to, you just dig out carrots. Turnips. Turnips are good for eating. Turnips are good for turnip greens if you like turnip greens. Turnips are great for tilling your soil up, getting that top four or five inches of the ground nice and loosened. Onions. There are onions that you can grow as a perennial crop. They're usually called walking onions, or some version of that. And they'll just keep coming and coming and coming. They'll grow through the winter, they'll grow through the summer, they'll grow in my grandmother's flower pots. Which those pots still exist, by the way. Those things are like 50 years old, and they're still hanging around. And they're made out of concrete. They don't make concrete that well anymore. Uh, pop choy, which is a type of brassica. Mustard greens are in here again. Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. By the way, you do not have to wrap the cauliflower leaves up around the cauliflower head. You only have to do that if you absolutely want white cauliflower. If you don't care what color your cauliflower is, generally if you don't wrap it up, it just becomes some shade of yellow. And that is perfectly fine and reasonable to eat. And if you like turning it into mashed potatoes, it usually blends in a little bit better. Um, garlic. Here in Tennessee, we plant garlic out in the fall. We harvest it in the late spring, early summer. Leeks. Our soil is usually not very conducive to growing leeks, so you have to actually make soil for the leeks. 
And then finally, walking stick cabbage, because all gardening doesn't have to be serious. You can actually eat the uh, leaves off of this like you would normal cabbage, but it has, with a kid for scale, like a four to six foot tall, sometimes even taller, up to ten foot trunk that you can actually take and turn it into like a walking stick, a broom handle, any sort of like a tool handle, anything that you need to actually reach something far away. You can cut it down and you can use it for that after a while. It also tends to be a little bit of a perennial vegetable, so it'll actually keep producing over time. So you plant it once and you get something off of it every year for a while. Uh, sources of information, of course, UT's extension publications, any of the other agricultural extension colleges, uh, Park Seed Catalog, Thompson and Morgan Seed. Uh, I absolutely adore Missouri's agricultural extension of botan and botanical garden information. Seed Savers is a catalog I have come to be quite fond of. Uh, MySquareFootGarden.net, I love the planner that she has on there. She also has a really cool companion planting Excel spreadsheet. So you can take it, click a drop down box and select a plant and it'll auto populate what you don't want to plant with that plant and what you do want to plant with that plant. Uh, Stark Brothers, not really vegetables but more of your fruiting shrubs, fruit, uh, bushes and trees and vines. They're a great source for those. They celebrated their 200th anniversary last year. So they were back for, the, for around back when you used to send out paper to everybody in large catalogs. If you've ever, if you've never seen the, like the old Sears robot catalogs, they're usually like thick, and you had these sitting there in the house. There's ever something your general store couldn't get, you'd have to actually mail off for these things. You know, instead of using the internet for ordering and everything, we actually used to use the mail system. So, uh, thank y'all. Any questions?